Hi, welcome to my podcast, Stories by Vera V. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, Sarah Jane, and we'll be discussing what's it like being a law student and studying law. Interesting stories by interesting people. Stories by Vera V. So how have you been today? I've been really good. I have um, been studying law since seven o'clock this morning. So it's been a lot. Um, My whole life is readings. So that's what I've been up to today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Your whole life is reading. (laughs) Um, Currently, yes. I mean, before law school, I really loved reading. But now I get to read for 10 to 12 hours a day. So it's very exciting. (laughs) Yeah, but with I watched before our little thing, I watched like maybe five law school vlogs and most of the vlog is just the time lapse of the person studying and just reading and taking notes yeah I mean that's all we do I know some people who are able to do other things and I'm like wow how do you have a work-life balance I would love (laughs) to figure that out this semester because I haven't I haven't yet and um so yeah it's a lot it's just studying all the time Mm -hmm. and are you a first year law student Yes. So I'm a first year. I just finished my first semester at American University, Washington College of Law in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And for your because the system is based on how I researched it, this might be wrong, is a person Mm -hmm. first gets their undergraduate and then they take the LSAT. Right. And then Mm -hmm. they do. So. No, go ahead. (laughs) Yeah. So you have to at least have an undergraduate degree there's a lot of people with also masters or phds in my class which is amazing everyone is so smart but you have to have at least a bachelor's and then you take the lsat and then you can get admitted to law school and also isn't there a personal statement aspect of it as well yes um that (laughs) that 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 is a um very big aspect of applying to law school it's a very stressful part because you kind of have to say something that is very important to your life and adds meaning to law or wrapping your whole life up in a paper. And it took (laughs) me six months to write it because I would write it and then delete it because I hated it and then write a whole new one and delete it because I hated it. Because I was like, this one paper does not capture everything I am to show who I am outside of my grades so it took me a whole six months to write it but um yeah did you have any is it similar to the personal statement you write when first applying to university for the undergraduate degree is that like a similar thing yeah um most schools they don't have like a prompt that I found some schools do have a prompt they want to know like your professional skills that'll help you add to the classroom or what makes your perspective different to add to a legal classroom. Um, But the majority of them, it is just a personal statement, kind of like the one for undergrad, but you want to be able to tie it towards why you want to go into law in a way. Mm -hmm. So like something about your life that makes you passionate about law. Okay. This makes sense. And why did you want to go into law? So That is a very big question. There's a lot of answers, (laughs) but um, the main reason was I really am very passionate about education policy and I want to be able to do education policy reform. And I could do that without a law degree, but I wanted to get knowledge in law and the court systems and the government and be able to, to apply that to working in policy one day. And I knew for sure that I wanted to go to law school is this was what my whole personal statement was about was that there was, I entered a mentorship program that I was teaching this little boy from Tanzania English. I have never taught anyone English in my entire life and I don't know Swahili. So I got, you know, the books you read when you first learn, it's like the cat jumped over the dog. (laughs) Yeah, I was teaching a 13-year-old those books because that's the only way I thought to teach him English. I was like, oh, I'll teach him to read how I taught to read, how I was taught to read. And um, 
just kind of seeing the little help that he got in school and from the education system. I mean, they kind of just left him to the wolves kind of thing. And so he wasn't able to succeed in school um, because he didn't know English and very little people know Swahili. So he just didn't get the attention. And so that is why I wanted to go into law. Mm -hmm. And is he, was he part of the American education system or was it the program? Okay. So I was, he was part of the American education program. And then I was part of a group called the international rescue committee. And they actually were able to help bring him over as a refugee and his family. And then the organization kind of helps with like assimilation here and being Mm -hmm. able to like get a social security card and learning how to use the bus system, like very basic things, but also larger things like being able to give them money until they have jobs, helping them find jobs, giving them temporary housing until they have income. So there was a lot with that organization. Okay. That sounds great. And so with him in the school education system, he was kind of discarded. Yeah. And it kind of made me realize how many students that does happen to, um, and it's really sad that there's just not equal education at all through the public education system. Mm-hmm. I'm reading right now. Um, do you know David Goggins? <laughs> I feel like I've heard of the name, but I don't know for sure. So he was like a Navy SEAL and whatever. He's like a very tough, tough man. And he wrote a book, Can't Hurt Me. And he was talking about his education experience in the first two chapters and about how he was having trouble with school. And in second grade, this one teacher helped him because she noticed, right? But then in the third one, he moved um, to the other grade. The teacher just kind of was like, well, you either can do it or you can't. Uh Yeah. So I feel like that kind of relates. Because some, so I was just wondering, would you say that it's more of the teacher's, I guess, responsibility or the policy as a whole? I think there are a lot of people responsible, but I think it starts with the policy because the teachers in the schools don't have the resources. Like if you don't have the resources to teach someone who doesn't know English and there's no one in the school who can help him, but you all don't have the funding to bring someone in to actually help, then it's not exactly the teacher's fault. Um, Mm -hmm. Or even the schools. So I think it starts with policy, but then it breaks down a lot more, um, I guess, as you go down. Mm -hmm. Do you know what's up with the boy now? Yes. So I'm so proud of him. He currently lives in another state other than Florida. He messages me on Facebook all the time, Mm -hmm. and it's great. Um, he actually is a, a little rapper now and he makes little videos with his oh. friends in English. And so I'm very proud of him. He'll make like little YouTube videos and his English is so good now. So I'm very proud of him. And I'm like super proud of the confidence he has in like doing his little raps because he had no confidence when I first met him because he was like so confused. He couldn't communicate with anyone. And mm. it's just, it's really nice being able to see him like confident and happy now. Yeah, that's so cute. Yeah. The impact on a person's life. Yeah. And also, since we just came back from winter break, how has that been like for you in regards to studying and stuff? Well, I learned this year that winter break is not a break when you're in law school. It is when I got to apply to jobs. So I got to revise my um, writing sample. Um which was a memo that we did in our legal writing class. Then revising resumes, finding jobs, um, you know, preparing for next semester. So I made this really fantastic reading schedule for myself that I, this week, was going to get two weeks ahead so that I start school two weeks ahead on readings, just in case, like, I want a little buffer, um, at any time in the semester gets hard, like I can take a break uh-huh. um, because I wish I could have done that last semester. So I've, I have 400 pages of reading to finish 
um, by the end of the week. Like I've done <laughs> like 300 and 300 and I have like a hundred pages left. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's, that's winter break. <laughs> <laughs> that's so fun. <laughs> And with the reading, is it just textbooks or cases or how does that work? Yeah, so it is textbooks with cases in them and then analysis of the cases. It depends on the book. Some of the books, like I took civil procedure last semester, it was pretty much all cases. And we learned everything from cases. And then we had another book. It's the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure which is just a few hundred pages of civil procedure um, rules. And you kind of just read that and then you go to class and you discuss it and they, the professors make it make sense because some of these classes, when you do the reading, it, I have no idea what I'm reading. And then I go to <laughs> class, my professors are amazing and it all makes sense. <laughs> uh huh. And also in class, I heard that they're cold calls. Yes. So a lot of people talk about cold calls like they're terrible. Um, and they're, they're honestly not. I think it depends on the school you're in and your student body. But my school, at least, you get cold called, but it's, there's no pressure if you get things wrong. They just want to know that you're putting in a best effort. And if you get things wrong, they make it a teaching opportunity And they really stress how they don't ever remember when people make mistakes. Mm -hmm. It just, as soon as we answer, it leaves our brain, their brain. So it is very high stress because you're in a lecture hall, 90 other students. And the professor just randomly says, Sarah, will you help us out on this? And you're like, oh, okay. (laughs) Let me just explain this whole case to the whole class. Um, So it's terrifying, but it also keeps you paying attention because in the event that you get randomly called on, you have to be paying attention. So it keeps my focus. I I love cold calls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of like a little benchmark throughout the course. Have you ever had one where you weren't prepared? No, not yet. Um, (laughs) I, I had one where like, I didn't fully know if I was correct. It was like on an my first 1800s case that I've ever read. So it's like in old English and it made no sense, but everyone told me that I did a decent job. I felt like I did terrible, but supposedly it wasn't horrible. Okay. Okay. That's good. Yeah. And with the cases, so I guess I'm just wondering about how the, um, the course flows down. Cause do you, take required classes or do you choose what to take in the first year so my first year the first semester everything is picked out for us so I took civil procedure contracts torts and legal writing and research and then next semester we have required is criminal law constitutional law property and then we get one elective and then another semester of legal writing and research. And then next year, I believe I choose all my courses. I think there's only like a few more required courses. I have no idea how many. And then I get to choose kind of like a major. There's not really a major, but you could take classes towards your interest. Okay. And yours would be education policy, right? Mm-hmm. So just government law and public law and then education Mm-hmm. as much as I can find in our course load. Okay. That's cool that you get to choose as well. Yeah. Kind of... I'm very excited. Yeah. So which one are you going to take next semester as the elective? So I'm taking public law. Um, I, I'm i not exactly sure what that means yet. At the beginning of every course, I'm like, I, I don't know what this is <laughs> fully. Um, and then at the end of the semester, like at the beginning of last semester I'm like I don't even know what a tort is like what is I have no idea what a tort is and then (laughs) at the end of the semester I was like laughing remembering that memory that I had no idea what this is and now I have so much knowledge on one topic that I didn't even know existed um but yeah mine is this coming semester gonna be public law and I think that is 
um, government law in general? I'm guessing. I don't fully know. When does the second semester start? On Monday. So January 10th. Oh, oh my gosh. That's so <laughs> yeah. soon. I know. When does yours start? Um, the second, I mean, I graduate on Thursday. So. How do you graduate in January? I'm just because doing an early graduation. So I, yeah, I'm but graduating. why is it not before winter break? Oh, I don't know why they did that. So we have all our <laughs> finals and everything before winter break. And then there's a two-week buffer period where nobody does absolutely anything, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And then the second semester starts. Oh, do you have to take any, did you have to do any classes or anything until you graduate? Um, well, yeah, I'm taking like the required now. Oh, it's just like such a strange setup to me because I feel like you would have, they would have had you graduate at like the end of last semester versus the beginning See, yeah. that would have made sense, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, but at least you're almost done. You're so close. I'm so excited. And also yeah. with law school, is it possible to graduate it early? Yes. So okay. I know of a few people who have done it. I, that is a feat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think you can do it if you take summer classes every year. I'm pretty sure... It's probably only feasible to graduate a semester early. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't think you can even graduate before a semester early. But you can graduate a semester early. That is just, that is a task. Because <laughs> <laughs> then you'd have to be ahead of yourself by, how long is a semester? How many weeks is it? 16? I believe 16. Yeah. <laughs> so you would have to be like five or six classes ahead. So if you took like two or three classes a summer, you could get it done. But over the summer, it's very important they get work experience. Oh, yeah. Because the jobs that you have over your summers in law school, it really determines your first job out of law school and your first job out of law school is the hardest one to get so most people are working like 40 hours a week during the summer so adding classes on to that that's why I'm like I have no idea how people do this uh -huh. um so yeah what kind of jobs is it during the summer is it mostly internships yes so some firms it's mostly big law firms that they offer summer associate positions and those are paid, but most, at least the first year summer jobs are not paid. And so they're just internships with, I mean, there's a lot of options. So you can be in the government or private firms or um, working for judges. So, yeah. Have you started into looking the ones you're going to pursue in the summer? Or is that too far away? Yes. Yeah? No. Yeah. I actually have had deadlines that already passed um so I've applied to about eight jobs so far and I have 32 on my list um oh my gosh. <laughs> because the legal field is highly saturated and it is it's tough to get jobs um so I'm kind of just applying to a lot to make sure that I am employed this summer mm -hmm. um so yeah it is it's stressful, but, you know, it'll be okay. Um, I've never applied to so many jobs <laughs> before, but I'm hoping that it pays off. They told us in our, like, career center, I asked, I was like, is 30 jobs too many to apply to? She's like, oh, no, that's normal. She's <laughs> like, if you apply to 10 and you get one interview, that's really good. I was like, what? Oh I was like, apply to 10 and get one interview. Um <laughs> So 10% yeah. success. <laughs> yeah. So at least three interviews. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that statistic, <laughs> hopefully <laughs> more. Um, but I guess we'll find out. I'm not too sure how this employment process works past the applications so far. Mm. So there's no date for when they're going to do the interviews or anything. No idea at all. No. Um, 
Not that I know of yet. Uh, we do have a public interest recruitment fair that I applied to several. So I believe it is the end of January. There'll be on campus interviews for those if I was mm. selected. So that would probably be my earliest interview. Um, but they said we should hear back from places before spring break. Okay. Okay. So not too much suspense. So. No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. And then some firms that I applied to, they were like, we can't respond to every candidate. And I was like, oh, so even if you reject me, I won't even get a response. I'm just going to be <laughs> sitting here waiting, wondering. <laughs> so, oh, my gosh. At least send like some sort of automated email, you know, just the message for everybody who didn't get in. Yeah. I mean, it just goes back to law is very saturated right now. Like there are a lot of law school students and there's not as many jobs as there are students. So Mm -hmm. law in general is very competitive and that's why they have rankings in law school. So it's like one big competition and employment is sadly kind of based on those rankings so that's how you secure a job because it is so saturated. Uh huh. And the rankings, it's public information or is it kind of private to everybody where only they know? Um, it's private. So based on your GPA, you're going to get a percentile of what, of what rank you are in the class. Mm-hmm. So it's like f- the top 5%, the top 10%, 15 and then below. Um, and yeah, so you'll just know based off your GPA and then you'll tell jobs what your ranking is and that's at least how you get the first few until you have legal work experience and then once you're out of law school I believe and I hope it is based more on my experience rather than forever my law school ranking hovering over my head Um, but In law school, does the undergraduate GPA matter at all? So I recently found out, yes. So some of only the first year, some jobs actually ask for your undergraduate transcripts um, because getting law school grading is interesting. So I actually didn't receive all of my grades until today. And (laughs) I finished these exams over three weeks ago. Um, (laughs) And my school gives them early. Like some, most schools don't give grades until like the end of January, early February. So they have to ask for your undergraduate transcripts, some of these jobs, because they have no idea um, any indicator of your academic success. Oh, wow. (laughs) That's very delayed. (laughs) Yeah, but other than that, and it's only a few jobs that I've seen ask. Um, other than that, um, undergrad no longer matters. Mm-hmm. And for your undergraduate degree, what did you major in? I was in political science at Florida State University. And that's very common, right, for um, for most law students to be political science majored? Yeah, Um Most of my friends and people I'm in class with a lot were political science majors or government or economics, um, things in there. And there is actually quite a few that were in STEM. So if you want to be an intellectual property law, a lot actually require a STEM background. Mm -hmm. Um, So that is a very highly growing um, field of law. So now there is more people in STEM going into law now. Mm. And it's mostly, are there any that you've seen that don't belong to those categories that are like very out of it? Um, not that I can remember. There are, um, cause you can have majored in anything to, there's no major requirements for applying to law school. But I personally cannot remember anyone that has something like very out of the ordinary. Yeah, because I guess everything just builds up eventually. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, it's a good background to get a political science degree because like I learned about different court systems, um, and just politics, like things that are very basic to law school that actually have not come in handy at all yet. Um, <laughs> but, uh, hopefully my undergraduate degree that it took four years to do at least comes in handy at some point other than just being a stepping stone to law school. I mean, you got three and a half more years, so we'll see. (laughs) With American University, did you know that you wanted to go there for law school specifically, or was it not one of the top choices? So I was not really sure where I wanted to go because I applied during the middle of the pandemic, so I couldn't visit any law schools. Um, And it was just it was hard applying during the pandemic and getting information from law schools as much. So I, I didn't really have a top. I just had a few schools that I really liked, but I wasn't like, this is the one. Mm -hmm. Um, and I got into American and before law school, I said my dream was to either move to Boston or DC. And I got into the school here. I came to visit. Um, I learned more about the school and I was like, oh, this is the one. I really loved it. And I love my decision so far. It's been so great. What do you most like about it? Was it just the general atmosphere that captured you? I mean, it is the most beautiful campus. But so that was that first caught my eye. It's like brand new our campus and it is just gorgeous. But um, once I got here, the students and the professors are amazing. I was horrified to go to law school because I was like, oh my gosh, all these professors are going to be mean. They're going to be like terrifying. I thought they were going to be like the most horrible people I've ever met in my entire life. Uh And they are so kind and so caring and they teach so well. Like one of my professors I was having a hard time just in my personal life and I was at office hours and I started crying. And this woman, she took over 30 minutes just to tell me funny stories (laughs) and make me feel better. And then throughout the semester, when she would like get me alone, she would check on how I was doing. And that was, that really made my whole like experience last semester and being able to adjust was like knowing that there's so much support in my school and the, I don't know, the students are the same. It is, I thought law school students, like I had a perception of what they would be. And then I came here and met the most like kind, amazing people I've ever met in my entire life. So that is why I love my school is just, it's the people. That's very interesting that you mentioned the perception. Cause usually when you watch those shows, like oh, what's the one with, um, something about murder how to get away with murder oh it just seems so tough and like a very ruthless atmosphere yeah and I it really does depend on the school like that that exists um Mm. but not at my school and I love (laughs) that it's just a supporting loving environment and I think at least for me like the way I learn I've been able to succeed a lot more in that kind of environment than I think I would in like how you perceive in the TV shows, which is what I thought I was walking into. (laughs) That's good to know that not every single law school is the same, that there is that that exists. Yeah. And once I got to law school, I, I have a friend who's in the application process right now. And I was like, find a school that aligns with your views because based on the school's beliefs and the school's views, it's going to impact the professors they bring in Mm -hmm. and what the professors teach. Like a lot of my professors last semester, they made a very important note on not just like the importance of the law, but where the law doesn't equally impact all people or where um, judges or policy can do better. And I really liked that they added that aspect rather than like, this is the law and the law is the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So yeah, I just really enjoyed that. Where would you find that for the school's, I guess, values and beliefs? Is it, because it's not like really the core values on the website, right? You have to dig a little deeper. No, I think it's just talking to admissions and then asking admissions to connect you with professors before you um, either apply or during the application process. Um, Because a lot of them are very happy to either let you come see a class, connect you with professors or even students. And I think actually connecting with those people and um, taking advantage of those resources, you'll find where you belong a lot better than on their website. No, yeah, for sure. So it's an opportunity to just come during one of the lectures and sit through it and just listen? Yeah, most schools allow you to. It's probably a little different now with um, COVID. Yeah. But now with everything going back online, I'm sure most schools would allow you to reach out and ask to attend a Zoom session um, if you're interested in applying. I'm not sure for the ordinary person who's not interested in applying if they would <laughs> yeah. say yes. But um, for applicants, like law schools always want you to apply to their schools, um, whether to admit or to not, but they want people to apply. Um, So they're kind of willing to take any measure to have students apply. Okay, that makes sense. And you mentioned that everything's going back up online. Yes, at least for the next two weeks. Um, Mm. But with how things went last time, I just like, I feel like I just am negative and I'm like, oh no, we're going to be online the whole semester. Like my, my whole law school career is going to be online. I'm so (laughs) dramatic, but like, I'm really hoping it's the next two weeks. But from what I've heard, I haven't actually like looked it up. Washington DC actually has the worst numbers right now. So it will most likely be more than two weeks, but I'm not sure yet. And this semester has been all in person or kind of? Yes. Hybrid? Okay. It's been all in person. It was amazing, um, which is why I'm very depressed about it going on Zoom. And also I've heard of the Socratic process like during, what is that? Do you know? So it's the same thing as cold calling. So it's okay. just having students contribute. Um, so that's, yeah. Socratic method is just cold calling. Okay. And for the online, do you think it's going to change much, the whole general atmosphere of learning? Um, yes. Um, I did online classes in undergrad um, during the pandemic, but it's a lot different. I'm not exactly sure how it will be um, for these classes, but I, a lot of my professors, we would work on like problem cases and we would get to turn to our neighbor and kind of discuss, um, just those problem cases for like five or 10 minutes. And so we're not going to be able to have that collaborative aspect, at least while we're online. Um, and I just think it's a lot different being online versus actually in person, not just the like obvious ways, but just in just in like small ways and how you learn. I think also participation wise, usually online, it kind of plummets because nobody like wants mm-hmm. to sit in front of their computer for hours at a time. Yeah, no. Um, yeah. And Zoom fatigue is very real. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah, sitting through a two hour lecture in person, I found they flew by. Like I felt like it was like a 30 minute time span. <laughs> But on Zoom, I don't think it's going to be the same. I think it's going to feel like it's two hours that we're sitting there. Um, I hope not, because I would like to not zone out mid-lecture. Um, but I, I, it'll be okay no matter what. Did you guys, do you think you're going to have breakout rooms for discussions and such? Maybe. I forgot those existed. We didn't. It's <laughs> so awkward. They are because no one actually contributes in a breakout room. <laughs> Everyone's like their cameras are off and they're muted and everyone refuses. So like, even if we do get breakout rooms, maybe people are different in law school. I mean, this was an undergrad. People were like that. Hopefully people are more mature now <laughs> and will actually contribute when they're not being watched. 
but maybe they'll use breakout rooms. We'll see how that goes. Hopefully there's going to be a little bit more enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. And you also, I know that you mentioned that some of the students, they have masters and PhDs. So is it all in that same similar spheres? Um, not really. So one of my writing deans fellows, so it's a student from the year prior who got an A in the class who then assists. She it has a PhD in biochemistry wow. because she's trying to go in intellectual property law um so she has a biochem degree i know people with masters in public policy um a few in some kind of economic degree because they would like to go into like tax law um, so usually it applies to the kind of law they want to go into, but it's very varied. Um, and I found not only do people like get other degrees before they come in, but a lot of people also work. I, there, there's like a handful of like people my age, but there's a lot who have a lot of work experience. It's really interesting being able to hear my classmates work experience and, what they were able to do before law school because like I I have none like I've just been in school yeah that's very unexpected yeah I didn't expect that at all but I forgot what the mean age for entering law school but I think it's around like 25 so a lot of people do get experience prior Mm -hmm. and have you ever considered that option um like before I applied to law school yeah um not really um I was thinking like if I didn't get I was I applied like as soon as I could but I was thinking like before the application process if I didn't get in I would work and then keep studying the LSAT retake it and then reapply but it was never my intention to get a career and work in a career for a while and then go back to school. I just don't, I don't think I personally would be able to go back to school after being done. Mm -hmm. I've heard of that. I just um, recorded with this guy and he's, he's writing his PhD while he's writing a book. And with the PhD, he went in straight after the undergraduate because he said the same thing that he wouldn't be able to just come back to it if some time has passed. Yeah. I think it's a lot easier to just keep going than take a break. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I personally think. I have no idea. It might actually be better to take a break, <laughs> but at least like I'm in the groove of studying and like I'm kind of used to it versus like if I was able to experience the real world without studying every single day, I might not want to go back to studying every day. <laughs> what was the last time, I guess, day where you just didn't study? Like, was it? while back on Christmas I didn't do anything okay (laughs) um but like before Christmas break in the semester I had not taken a day off since before school started so from now where I started readings for this coming semester on Monday I will unlikely take a full day off until finals Um, I might take like a half a day off, but it is highly unlikely that I will take a full day off until I'm done with finals. Wow. That's a very (laughs) rigorous schedule. (laughs) Yeah. No, like you don't have, you don't have to be like this at all. Like you can, I mean, law school, you get what you put into it. So I because like what I said prior about like how the legal field is so saturated, like I really, I want to be employed. So I just want to give myself every opportunity and the best shot at getting the jobs that I want. And so that means I study 10 hours a day so that I can get the highest grades in my ability and at the beginning of last semester, I was like, 
I don't want to get to the end of the semester and regret anything. Like, I don't want to regret that I could have studied more or I could have tried harder. So I did a lot and I did not have a single regret. I was so proud of the work I put in. So that's what I plan to do again this semester, just slightly healthier. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Love the improvement, but that's a very good mindset to have, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, you probably in every area of life should not work yourself to death. Um, But it's three years and the sacrifices or non-sacrifices that I make in these next three years are going to impact my future. And I just want to set myself up for the best future I can. And so, yeah, I just want my future self to be in the best position possible. So my current self just does a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And as I can imagine, because when you're studying for 10 hours a day, like sometimes I bet it can get a little bit overwhelming. So how do you navigate through that? I, um, I weight lift. So I, if as soon as I feel burnout, I'm like, okay, I'm going to the gym. I do some deadlifts (laughs) and I work out a bit. (laughs) And then I come home and I continue. I found out last semester that that's the way I beat burnout is I go to the gym and Mm -hmm. I kind of just like reset. I get all those feelings out. Um, And that, that, that's what helped me the most last semester. That and having, you have to have, I think in law school and any area of life that's very stressful is having people in your life who are going through the same thing. So my friend group, helped so much because we would just be able to like complain to each other (laughs) about the exact same things that we were all going through and then continue to do them so that helped me so much ranting sessions (laughs) yes oh the ranting sessions are very important just to get all those feelings out but also that's a very like a bonding experience because you guys are going through the same thing like you said lifetime friends Uh Yes, I we've like talked about that several times about how like not an actual trauma bond, but like how law school like jokingly trauma bonded us very quickly Uh Um, because like we we met during orientation, my friend group, and we got very close very quickly. And it was all because of how hard law school is. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, it does bond you with people and like your classmates you're all like very bonded to each other in a way, at least like my section is because like, we're all going through the same thing. We're all very stressed and I don't know. We all just get each other. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. No, that's great. That's really great. And for orientation. So you would recommend going to that for all those who are coming into law school for the first time? It is required at my school. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had, I remember one student was like, oh, I don't think I can come. And like the faculty was like, this is required. Like you need to come, you can skip it, but it's highly recommended that you come for your success. So it's optional, but required. Mm -hmm. Um, Like you can't force you there, but like you should go. Um, So it was like, I think it was just, three days of them kind of telling us how things are going to work. And then we got to meet with the career office. Um, I can't remember everything we did. It was just packed three days of just constant them like throwing information at us. How long was it each day? Mm, I do not fully remember. I think it was like nine to six possibly I know there was some longer days than others um but it it was long come for your success (laughs) yeah yeah um but I don't I I think it really does impact your success is at least them telling you how everything works um rather than showing up on the first day and not having that information no absolutely and also, isn't there some sort of summer reading before it actually starts the first semester? I think it depends on the school. So I 
when I got admitted to law school, I had watched like several vlogs and I knew <laughs> my my friend's brother went to law school and he was like, I had 300 pages of reading to do before the first day. Some of these vlogs, they had like hundreds of pages of reading. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have so much reading before. And mine didn't. I actually didn't have any prior readings to do, just like the readings for the first classes. So luckily I didn't have that. Okay, that's good. Because I'm just going based off of um, how to get away with murder because they all show up <laughs> on the first day. She's like, you didn't read this many pages. Yeah, like you have readings like you had to have done. Like one of my professors, she cold called the first day. Oh. Um, <laughs> like a lot of professors do cold call the first day and you have cases you already were have supposed to have read for all of the first day of classes. Um so, yeah, it is a little stressful when they start calling on you and it's the first day of class. Um, it's nothing like any of the prior schooling I had. It was like the first day of class. I'm like, oh, this is a syllabus. This is how the class is going to go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, here's here's a nice day. No, it was like a five minute review of how the class is going to go. And they're like, OK, the first case. <laughs> and they'll call on you. What happened? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> straight into it. <laughs> Yeah. For the cold calls in tr- um summaries, what do you have to summarize about the case? Just everything or there's just specific points you have to touch on? So most of the time they call on separate students for certain parts of the case. So they'll ask one student the facts of the case, another the holding, which is the court's decision, um, or the arguments of the separate sides on the case or the rules that apply in my civil procedure class, we were asked um, what rules would apply to certain things or to explain certain federal rules, which was always, I never had to explain any federal rules, (laughs) thankfully, because (laughs) the way they are written is, very legal and it did not make sense to me at all as in my first semester so that it's terrifying if you don't exactly fully know the information yeah I bet (laughs) the legal language yeah I still fully don't understand legal language I do a lot of googling and then I understand if I when I can put it in my own words then I get it. But a lot of the times, like just reading it straight, I have to break it down or else it's just, it goes over my head. It's kind of like with Shakespeare. Did you know that there's, I think it's a website. It's where you you, um, input whatever Shakespeare wrote and it translates it into normal human language. Oh, really? Yeah. And it's like Google Translate for training. (laughs) Wow. That's really great. I feel like somebody should create that for all the legal terms and for the legal language. They they have um, oh. certain sites currently for constitutional law. Just so I can break it down more, I found this website that explains everything so well. Because um, like when I read it, I can get a general sense of what they mean. But that website really helps me. Okay, that's great. Yeah. With studying, besides just breaking things down for yourself, do you have any specific methods they use? Because I've heard of like the Pomodoro technique and, you know, their whole bunch. I'm not sure what Pomodoro is, but (laughs) um, for casebook readings, so I really love, I have a highlighter method. So every color of my highlighters, it identifies a different thing in the readings. Um, So it kind of just helps me active read and, oh no, my dog, he's whining, but it helps me active read and um, just able to identify certain areas. And then once I do the first reading and highlight everything, I have a template that I made for my notes. So I write general non-case notes, which is just like rules from the reading or just certain important facts and then I have a case brief template that I put the main point of the case the issues discussed 
the facts, um, the holding, and rules. Uh-huh. So that is my reading study method. And then there's a whole nother study method I have for the actual studying. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that one is a lot more. You have to outline. And then from the outlining, I do a lot of practice because I found for myself to be able to retain and perform on the exams is I did a ton of practice exams and a ton of um, practice hypotheticals and that made exams easy. So I found that if you just practice in the format of the exam a lot, the exam is not going to be hard because you've done the exam like 15 times. Mm -hmm. So what do the exams look like? Is it just multiple choice or is it essay based? So it, there is multiple choice for two of my classes. There was around 15 multiple choice. And then for one of them, there was like 66 and then there's the essays. So (laughs) each essay prompt is like a page long and it just gives you a ton of facts of a situation So it could be, it's just all the facts of a situation that happened Uh and you're, you can have general issue spotting, which it just asks you to spot all the issues and all the defenses that apply to the facts. And there can be like 15 issues that you're supposed to discuss in like 45 minutes. So Your answer, depending on the essay, is like three to ten pages long. Um, Ten pages. And there's multiple essays. Like for my civil procedure exam, I think the entirety of the essays, it was like almost 20 pages of answer. Um, So it's... It, it is something. And they are four-hour exams. Oh. Um, <laughs> they're, they're a lot. And the multiple choice is also something I've never seen before. They are, again, like half a page to a page long prompts. And then the answers, there is at least two technically correct, but only one correct. And there was a few on some of my exams that every single answer was correct, but there's only one correct one. Uh So (laughs) you just have to find the most correct. And it is terrifying because you look at all the answers and you're like, these are all right. (laughs) So it's, it's a different kind of examination than I have ever experienced. And they're, they're not, I don't know. I didn't find them as horrible as I like as I'm describing them like I'm describing what they are but I just did (laughs) so many practice tests leading up to it that it was that it was okay where do you find the practice test is it provided as a an additional study resource so the professors usually provide at least a few of their previous exams and then Your school usually will provide study aids. So study aids are just different websites that normally you have to pay for, but they give them to us. So I found like four different sites that I did every single one of their multiple choice (laughs) that they had. Like I did like 500 multiple choice questions, like preparing (laughs) for finals. And I did like an absurd amount of essays that I would find on these study methods. I bought a book of towards hypothetical essays. Like (laughs) I, 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 I just found them everywhere. And like, it sounds crazy, but I think like that's the best way to study for finals is just doing an obsessive amount of practice exams because then at least you get to the exam. And again, like it's not hard because you did it like 20 times over. Yeah, 500 multiple choice questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it was excessive, but like, it worked. <laughs> as long as it worked. Are there any yeah. tests besides finals, like mid-class or so? No. Okay. Um, 
it's just finals. So your whole grade is dependent on finals and then participation, which participation is the cold calls, like being prepared to answer them. Mm -hmm. Um, For some classes, some classes have like um, non, they're non-graded. It's like participation only quizzes that Mm -hmm. that goes towards your participation grade. So it just depends on the class, but the exam is a minimum of like 75% of the grade. So oh, that's a, it is, a load. <laughs> yeah, it's terrifying. Like that one exam makes or breaks your entire grade. Are there no makeups, not makeups for it, but what if you miss it? What happens then? Well, like if you intentionally miss it or like forget about it, like you just get a zero, but if you're sick, Mm-hmm. Or if you have an excuse, you're allowed to de- defer the exam. And then I don't know when you get to make them up. But I be- I'm guessing like sometime early in the next semester, you get to make them up if you have an excuse. Okay. Okay. That's good. And you said they're four hours each? Yeah, that's the normal. So some, I had one that was three. Um but the average for the exams is four hours long. And they're all during the same week or is it more spaced out? So we got our, we have a two week exam period. So my, my exam schedule is amazing this semester. I had one the first Friday and then the following week I had them like very spread out. Uh It was It was fantastic, but they, they warned us that they just, they made that schedule for us nice because we're first years. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but that it's not going to be that great. Um, in the following years, um, yeah, a lot of classes, like they have a whole system because sometimes you have like two exams scheduled on the same day. So you have to defer the exam because you can't take two exams on the same day. Yeah. Um, it's just impossible. Also, just because of the t- the four hour like time blocks, is they're gonna like run into each other. How did you leave feeling after writing the exams? Like just tired. Hot. Well, I was very happy, honestly. Like because like I I was so nervous and like terrified because the format of the exam is very daunting. And just having, it's just so much is at stake. And I was like, am I going to be able to spot the issues? Like, what if I read this question? I have no idea what's going on. But luckily, I understood everything and I was able to answer everything effective. So I left and I was like, oh, I did it. Like, I was so proud of myself that I was able to effectively answer things. But then you get home and you sit down and I couldn't stand back up for like another day. (laughs) Um, so it's like immediate like endorphins and then they wear off and I'm just dead crash (laughs) yeah I crashed and burned after those exams more than I ever had in my entire life I had a headache for a week solid after the exam (laughs) um and it was just my body was done uh uh-huh. is it just everybody running on coffee and no sleep <laughs> during that time yeah um lots and lots and lots of caffeine I <laughs> love my school provided us free coffee during finals week so I was so <laughs> excited to go to and I was like oh I get free coffee now um but yeah there is a extreme caffeine addiction in law school um but yeah, it's kind of necessary, but at the same time, like, it's, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, I saw this one girl in the vlog, she was carrying this humongous, like, I don't know what that is, bottle mug, (laughs) and someone asked her if it was, I think, like, what's it called, the beer, I don't know, like, filled with alcohol, whatever, she was like, oh no, just my coffee, it's like three liters. (laughs) That's so much, oh, that is so much. But as yeah, long that, as it helps, you know. Yeah. Um, and like, no, so I know a lot of people who just don't sleep either. I have to get eight hours a night. Like, that was one thing going to law school that 
I refuse to sacrifice with my sleep. So I have slept eight hours a night every single night okay. through my first year. So like sleep is possible. You just have to like figure out what to prioritize. And I decided sleep was what I was going to prioritize. That's good. Cause usually it's always the first thing to go. Yeah. I, I can't, I won't function at all. And then I just won't learn. Um, so I can't. <laughs> yeah, definitely increased efficiency. Because I feel like if you rest, you just wake up and you're more ready to retain mm-hmm. all the information and such. Yeah, and I think it also helps with the burnout. Because if you're exhausted also doing these things and you're sleep deprived, like it, there's such a high workload that like I don't know how you even make it through a semester without getting extreme burnout. Yeah. And also you mentioned that you do weightlifting. So on, cause you slept for eight hours every single day. Were you also able to exercise every single day? So not every day I was not able to go as much as I wanted this past semester. That was one of the things I'm trying to prioritize this semester is at least going for 45 minutes, like five days a week. Um, so it was, it was really hard to fit it in and One of the things I realized in law school, I didn't think this would be my biggest struggle, but was getting in on your meals Um, because the stress and the caffeine, (laughs) it just, it was so hard to eat sometimes. And like, I would feel guilty taking a break to eat because I'm like, oh my gosh, I could be studying. Or I'm like, oh, I'll just eat once I finish like 40 more pages of reading. (laughs) And... So then I would be really weak by the end of the day. And I'm not letting myself go to the gym if I haven't ate properly, because that's just yeah. going to hurt me more than help. Mm. So this semester, I'm trying to be a lot more healthy. So like actually eating properly and going to the gym. So this semester, I will actually be able to go more. But last semester was like two days a week I was going to the gym. I think it's also a matter of adjusting. Because, I mean, that was your first semester. You know, you don't really know what to expect. You're just figuring it out. Yeah. So I was able to learn from my mistakes and make a much more efficient plan, which is where that horrible 400 pages of reading that I am doing this week um, to prepare myself. That way, I just want at the point in the semester where it's really stressful, like because there's, you know, just something big due or this coming semester, there's journals in law school. And getting on a journal is very important. Um, And so the weeks that we're trying out for the journal, they might be really stressful and I might not want to read. So I just wanted to get two weeks ahead. That way I could take breaks if Mm -hmm. I ever wanted to. Um, So just trying to make my life a little easier this time. That's great. And what is the journal? So they, it depends on the journal, but you, so I'm on a brief, I'll explain the brief because I don't know for every single journal. So a brief is like a mini journal. So I'm on the legislation and policy brief. So we write um, analysis or um, critiques of current policy Mm -hmm. or things going on in the legislature. So I actually wrote my first, like a scholarly article. I was very excited to have my first (laughs) scholarly article out. Um, And it is on the education policy, the Every Student Succeeds Act. And it was a critique of the issues with coronavirus and its implementation, as well as um, issues on the state implementation um, of the act. So that's basically what it is, is you write and then they publish it, but I don't fully know for the journals other than I, I do know it's writing uh-huh. and <laughs> depending on the journal you've been on, there's like a bunch of different journals. Uh, so there's like business, intellectual property, there's government ones. Um, so I'm, I think all of them have different topics that they write on okay that's very interesting and is it is every single one published from every student or is it selective so you first have to make it onto the journal um so the tryouts 
for it are very rigorous, I've been told. Um, and so if you're selected, then I believe you're required at some point to either write a comment or a note. I think the note is longer and a comment is a shorter note is what I was explained. Mm -hmm. And I believe every student publishes something. Um, and it's like highly reviewed. Like it goes through a ton of review um, processes. I was talking to an upper level student who's on the main journal at our school. And she was just explaining. She had like just gotten her note in. And it was just like so stressful. And then now it just goes through a ton of critiques. Oh. And then at some point in the semester, they um, publish that volume of the journal. Wow. That's very interesting that they do that. Yeah. But my explanation was like horrible. If anyone <laughs> listening wants to know more about journals, don't just take what I said, but actually research them because I have very little knowledge. But I feel like it's, it's a good overview. Yeah. <laughs> A good jumping point. Yeah, at least a good explanation of like the beginning of what it is. Mm -hmm. And also to conclude this episode, because you said you have 400 pages left. Do you read any anything leisurely or you're just done? Um, not anymore, because by the time I'm done with these readings, I don't want to read anything. I, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I just don't want to use my brain once I'm done. <laughs> So I used to read leisurely. Currently, no. This whole semester, nothing? Yeah, nothing last semester at all. Um, and like over the summer before, I was reading all of the time. It mm -hmm. was fantastic. And then I just read so much that I currently do not leisurely read. 400 pages <laughs> this week. I just can't imagine. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot, but I kind of did it to myself. Yeah, but you're going to be ahead, so. Yeah, it's going to help me. I was, I, I keep telling myself, I'm like, this week is not fun, <laughs> but the future you is going to be very happy <laughs> that you did this. Yeah, all right. Well, I don't want to keep you because <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of work, <laughs> so. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on. I've never spoken of to a law student before. So this is so exciting. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm happy to have like given an overview. Uh -huh. um, it is, it's definitely, it's stressful and it's a lot, but this, it's an amazing experience. Um, and I think it's, it's so worth it. It's, it's a lot, <laughs> but you know, it's completely fine. It's a really amazing process. Yeah, I feel like it just takes you to a whole new level, especially if you're yeah. passionate about it. Yeah, and it's the things I, I'm reading 400 pages, but like my criminal law textbook, I can't stop reading. It. Like, I don't <laughs> ever want to put it down right now because it's so good. And it's really exciting being able to like expand your knowledge. And, and while there is a good amount of people in law school, like not everyone gets this experience. And just being able to have the experience is very special in itself. So I think just being able to appreciate that and make the most of it is very important. That's a very beautiful, inspiring message to conclude <laughs> this with. Thank you. <laughs> of course.